Love you guys. Please stand. Shelly, what do you think you'd say about that? We're going to continue to worship today, but I want you to know that today is a, it's a bittersweet day. It's a day that, because I want you to know as I stand, I'm just like all of you. I've got a big old Dale Roach-shaped hole in my heart. But let me tell you how God's been feeling it today. Last Saturday, I wondered how he would do it. 
And he does, he's done it the way he does it so often in my life. He brings psalms and songs to my mind. And you're going to hear psalms today, I'm sure, because this is a special service. I think it's Psalms 116 that says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Today I've thought about these songs. There's a song, All the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy who through life has been my guide, heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell, for I know whatever befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. And the contrast is the last verse. We've just heard how it is on this earth, and here's what it says. All the way my Savior leads me, oh, the fullness of his grace, perfect rest to me is promised. In my Father's blessed embrace, when my spirit clothed immortal wings its flight to realms of day, this my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. Amen? Amen. My wife used to sing a song, and the chorus says, it says, Jesus led me all the way, led me step by step each day. I will tell the saints and angels as I lay my burden down. Jesus led me all the way. I believe that last Saturday morning, that's exactly what my pastor did. He laid the burden down. And, that, and it says in this verse, I will tell the saints and angels, I, I believe he said, listen, let me tell you. Let me tell you how it is, how it was. Let me tell you about amazing grace. Let's sing together, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Uh, for my folks in the booth, we're just going to sing the first and last stanzas. Just the first and the last stanzas. And if you would watch me for some leadership on the last verse. Chorus. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. in his love this is my story this is my song praising my Savior all the day long this So, so good, 
with every breath that I am able. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You are close like no as a father, I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God, and all my life you have been faithful, and all my life you have been so, so Amen. You may be seated. Today is going to be unusual in a way. We're going to hear from Dale's daughter, Dale and Shelley's daughter, Elizabeth. And right after her, Brother Terry Roach, his brother, is going to come. And then we're going to let Dale preach his own message today. And then we'll do some other things. So, Elizabeth. Thank you all for coming to celebrate the life of my precious dad. I'm not the best public speaker, and nerves tend to get to me. So I'm just going to read what I've written here and pray I get through it. Everyone who knows my dad knows what a wonderful man he was. I know he's my dad and I'm probably biased, but I truly think he was one of a kind. He was gentle, he was calm, he was non-judgmental, he was caring, he was loving, he was an artist, he was a leader and a servant. He was a husband, 
a father, a grandfather, son, brother, and friend. He had a passion for sharing God's love with anyone and everyone he could. He was always on the move working and serving the Lord, but he was always on the move, period. We joked with him a lot about how much of a busy bee he was. He had to be doing something all the time. We joked that he had ants in his pants. For example, on our beach trips, it was hard for him to sit still on the beach. He was either playing with the grandkids, taking pictures, working tirelessly on sand sculptures, running to get us food, or in one instance, our umbrella broke, so he ran to Lowe's and came back with two. He just always did for others. He was the fixer of all things in my world. Anytime we needed something, he was there. Growing up, John, Alex, and I referred to him as the fun guy because he did all the fun stuff with us. He was the dad that made homemade slip and slides. He played with us outside, rode bikes with us, took us to the park. I remember when it would snow, he would go to an old car garage and find inner tubes and he would tell us to hop on and give us a good push and we'd go sailing down the hill. Mom says he did all the fun stuff with us because he was just a big kid at heart and he enjoyed it as much as we did. I know he enjoyed it and I know he was excited to spend time with his kids. I have so many memories of him that I could tell but we'd be here for a really long time. I never once doubted his love for John, Alex, or me. He loved his family fiercely and with a passion. I also never doubted his love for my mom. In high school, I had a couple what I like to call rough patch years. I remember being in a pretty heated argument with my mom and my dad calmly pulled me aside and firmly said, listen, I love you, but I have loved your mom longer and you aren't going to disrespect her like this ever. That set a standard for me right there on the spot. My parents were a team, and even though my dad loved his children, my mom came before us the way the Bible says it's supposed to be. He loved my mom so much, and it truly showed. He would do anything in this world for her, and everyone knew it. My husband Garrett told me when he asked my dad for my hand in marriage, my dad said, yes, on one condition, you love my daughter like I love her mom. He also loved his grandkids. He was so proud to be Pop. I'm sad that my daughter won't remember him, but I'm going to make sure she knows all about him and what a remarkable and wonderful man he was. Dad was called at 17 to be in the ministry. He had a deep passion to share the love Jesus had for all of us. Being in the ministry is not always easy. Being a preacher's kid, I've seen the good and I've seen the not so good. But when the not so good hit, Dad never wavered in his faith or calling. He leaned on God and he leaned on my mom. I can't tell you how many times I'd see him with his Bible open reading and studying and making notes. He was the same exact person at home that he was in the pulpit. He truly lived his faith every single day. He led many to Christ. He comforted many in times of need. He prayed over many throughout his life. He was humble and he knew we were all in this together. He was truly a bright light in this world and you could see it in him without him even saying a word. I would not be telling the truth if I said I was at peace at this moment, because I'm not. I'm only human, and I'm having a hard time understanding why my precious daddy was taken too soon for me and my family. But I keep going back to something I heard him talk about several times in his sermons before, and I'm sure a lot of you here have heard him talk about it. 
My mom used to cross stitch, and if you've ever seen someone do that, it truly looks like a total mess on one side. Threads going every which way, you can't make heads or tails of what's going on. But when you turn it over and look at the other side, you can see the picture clear as day. I can't wait for that day when I can see the picture clearly. I know my daddy will greet me with open arms and all of it will make sense. I'm going to miss his, how's your day been sweetheart text. I'm gonna miss his birthday song every year. I'm gonna miss his advice, his hugs, his calming presence in my life, his laughter and so much more. We were reading through one of Dad's old journals Tuesday night. We came across an entry he'd written in 1989. He was 28 years old. He was talking about John and how he was growing by the minute and he couldn't believe he was three already. He also said, and I quote, I'm still amazed at the tender life God has allowed us to borrow. That sentence stood out to me because my dad, at 28 years old, knew we were all on this earth for a short period of time. He knew John belonged to God, and he knew he belonged to God, along with the rest of us. I realize this hurt and pain will never go away. It'll get easier, but never be gone. I know my family and I will have to learn to live with it. To so many, he was a pastor, but to me, he was my dad. And there's a big piece missing from our family now. But I know where he is. And I take comfort knowing I will see him again one day. I'm thankful to God that he let me borrow this precious soul for 33 years. And I got to call him dad. My name is Terry Roach, and on behalf of my family, especially Shelly and the children, I want to tell you how grateful we are for the love and support that you guys have given to our family. It was during times like these that we really see how blessed we truly are and what friends we have. I want to share today uh, a side of Dale that, that many of you may not have known for many here today, you knew him as a friend. Some knew him as a pastor. Others knew him as an author, a counselor, a sculptor, a musician. And the list goes on and on of how your life intersected with Dale. Mom knew him as a son. But my sister and I, Greta, we knew Dale in a way that no other person could ever claim. We knew him as brother. Dale was the firstborn. And as I would often tell him, he was the golden child. He, it, it didn't matter. It, it really didn't matter what he did. It just it seemed like he never did anything wrong. And, and it was later on in years when I kind of finally figured this thing out. That the reason he never did anything wrong is because he always blamed me. <laughs> and, and so today, you know, I just want to set a couple of stories straight because coming through the line, I heard many folks say, you're Terry, we've heard all kinds of stories about you. <laughs> and I told them it all depended on the day and the story of what you heard. And, and I can assure you mine and Dale's story differed just a little bit. And so I'm going to set the record straight on a couple of stories that happened in our life. I can truly say that we had a wonderful, wonderful life. Mom and dad raised us kids and we just had just a wonderful time growing up. But mom, I need to ask you a question. I need to, do you remember when we lived in Gilkey and you and dad were having some guests over uh, for dinner and dad's specific instructions were to us boys 
Now, boys, I want y'all to stay outside and don't be working on that go-kart you've been working on. I don't want to hear a bunch of beating and banging on the go-kart. And so they went in, and of course, Dell and I said, let's work on the go-kart. So we took it around back and, and down toward the basement where we didn't think we would be heard. And so as we were working on that go-kart, Dell was just pounding away with a hammer on that go-kart. I, I didn't know what he was doing, so I leaned in just to see what he was doing. And about that time, he nailed me right in the head. Well, I hit the ground and I get up, I'm crying. I've got a pump knot on my head. I look like a unicorn. And Dale, if you knew my brother Dale, he was like, <laughs> he, he, he just started. He was nervous as a cat. I'm just telling you, he was, he was just extremely nervous. And so we figured out we had to go tell mom and dad because it's not on my head. And so we walk into the house, and mom and dad are in the dining room, and we walk in there, and we stand there at the door. They see my head, and Dale looks at them, and he said, the hammer hit his head. <laughs> mom, I just want you to know, Dale hit me in the head with a hammer. It, it, was just, it was just one of those things. And, and do you remember the time? that we went out, and, and there's not a lot of children in here, I don't think, but we went out and we played the old purse trick. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but you get an old pocketbook, you tie a fishing line around it, you set it out on the side of the road. You would be amazed how many people stop and check that pocketbook. I'm, I'm serious. And so we set that out there and, and, and we did this and this lady stopped, got out of her car, but before she could get to the pocketbook, of course, we jerked it and it wasn't nowhere to be found. And, um, and we started laughing and she got mad. She started chasing us. And, and I just want mama to know that was Dell and Terry date. I was just along for the ride. I, I didn't have anything to do with that. I was just there. But one of the greatest memories I have of living in that, in Gilkey at that time is back when uh, one Christmas, Dale got an electric guitar for Christmas and I got a set of drums, something similar to that, except they were red and metallic. And we used to go in there and we used to beat and bang and we would play and we would just have us a good time. And, and there was one song that we learned how to play better than anything. And I'm just here to tell you today, smoke on the water never sounded so good. <laughs> it, it was just one, one of those things. But we moved shortly after that, and we moved to Seneca, South Carolina. And when we got there, our lives changed in ways that we could not even imagine. When we got there, Dad had been pastoring for a little while, and he uh, was diagnosed with leukemia. He, he became sick, and Dale surrendered to the ministry while he was still in high school. Dale graduated from high school. Dad ended up having to retire, and, and we moved back to Forest City, North Carolina. And Dad died in August of 1980, just a few days before my senior year of high school. And so our lives changed in a lot of different ways during that time. Dale was in college. He was pursuing a career in ministry. He was trying to, to be the man of the house. Dale met the love of his life, Shelley. I ended up graduating, our grandmother passed away. Those were some difficult years, but mom and Dale, mom and Dale were the glue that held our family together. Greta told me a story just a few days ago. Greta's our sister, and, and I didn't ask her if I could share this story, but I'm going to share it anyhow. I'll ask for, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission, by the way, but I'm going to, I'll, I'll, she was telling me that she was younger and it was during those formative years of her life, and Dale was trying to be the man of the house and, and all of these things. And so Greta was coming of age, and so Dale bought her a book. And he gave it to her and he began to explain to her about the birds and the bees. 
And Greta told me the other day, she said, I guess that's why I didn't have children, because I didn't know how to. <laughs> you know, when you... <laughs> Dale was remarkable in, in many ways, but there were some things that, yeah, well, anyhow. But during that time in our lives, that, that period of our lives, Dale made one of the most important decisions in his life. That's when he had met Shelly and they had started dating and finally, finally, he asked Shelly to marry him, which was, and that was good because Shelly was not only beautiful, but she was smart. She was talented and tough. And I'm just here to tell you, if you're gonna be a roach woman, you gotta be tough. It's just the way we guys are and that's just the way our family is. But she was tough. And I liked her. As a matter of fact, and she's heard me say this a thousand times, I liked her so much, I went and got me one. My wife's named Shelly. <laughs> and they are a lot alike. <laughs> and I'm thankful for that because I love you, Shelly. And I just want to thank you for loving my brother. For taking care of him. You helped him become the man. That he was. John, Elizabeth, and Alex. I, I don't know of a man. <clears throat> excuse me. I don't know of a man who loved his children more than Dale did. I mean, he just loved you guys, and and I'm telling you, Dale was so very proud of the men and the woman that you guys have developed into. You see, you guys were the icing on the cake. Shelley was the cake. You guys were the icing. And you just made it. Garrett and Caitlin, Dale loved you as well because you were part of his family and you were loving the people that he loved the most. And I want to thank you for that. Them grandbabies. Oh, Dale loved them grandbabies. And they were the cherry on top of the icing. You see, it just, I mean, it just was a beautiful, beautiful picture to see Dale and Jack and Marin and the baby girl to come. I want to give you some instructions as your uncle and as a pastor and as a man of God. Those children will grow up without knowing Dale, but the life he lived, it lives on through you. It lives on through you. And Shelly, I want you to tell them grandbabies what a good husband he was, what a good man he was. Parents, I want you to tell him what a good dad he was. And I want your life to be lived in such a way that those grandbabies will know the faith of Del Roach because you lived out your life in front of them. And although they've not gotten to spend a lot of time with him and one that will never know him, your life will demonstrate Dell's faith because his faith was powerful. That's what led him and sustained him for 40 years, these last 40 years. So please live out your life as a tribute to your dad and his faith and his love for God and his love for family and his love for fellow man. There was one tradition that Dale started, and I don't know if he ever knew that he really started it. Many years ago, as our families were smaller and the, and the children were small, my children were also small, mom decided she wanted the family to, to be together for a vacation. She wanted us all together. And so she rented the first beach house we ever stayed at. And we used to go down there every year and we would rent this house and we would stay and we'd spend the week together. And I'll be the first to admit there were a few weeks that I was ready to come home. But I'm telling you, the good far outweighed anything that happened. And we would go down there and we would spend time. And over the years, our families have grown. They've, the kids have gotten married. They've had grandchildren. And, and we've, we've gone and rented our own house. But we all still go to the beach every year. Well, one of those beach trips we were on, getting toward the latter part of our, our family stay, 
is we were all in the house, and, and if you're familiar with those houses, they usually have a big dining room, and there's tables and couches and all of that stuff. And, and we would go in there and do puzzles. We would listen to music. We would just have a good time. And, and, and one time we were in there, and we were listening to some music. And all of a sudden, I don't know who played it, Mustang Sally came over the, over the speakers. And Dale, in his uh, funny ways, began to sing Mustang Sally. Then he began to do the Egyptian thing. And as he was doing that, he did the stair walk down behind the couch. It was hilarious. It was just a time in our lives to where we were all together and we were just having a wonderful time. And the tradition that started from that is every single year, before I load my family up to go on our beach trip, I will play Mustang Sally. (laughs) Because it puts us in the mood of being at the beach and the fond memories we shared together as a family. I was kind of a late bloomer as I surrendered to the ministry back in 1992. And Dale had already been in it for a while, and Dale taught me how to do a lot of things in the ministry. He taught me how to administer the Lord's Supper for the first time. I mean, you would think that that there would be classes for that, but I've not really found any good classes for that. It takes godly men who have a heart and a passion to, to teach and to train, and Dale was a teacher. He loved to help people. He was, a, he was just one of those who wanted to be there for you. And so he helped me to walk me through how to administer the Lord's Supper. He, he helped me when I performed my first wedding. And I will tell you right now, I was more nervous than the bride and the groom. But Dale walked me through that and told me what I needed to do and how I needed to do it. And, and it was just an amazing thing. And there were other many things in our ministry. When I took my church in, in Marion... Dale came and he, he did an assessment of our church and he says, listen, there's a couple things you need to do. You really want to help grow this church because his, his, his passion was to grow the church. And we implemented those things in our church and, and it's been a blessing and we've seen, we've seen a lot of things out of it. But one of the things that Dale taught me is how to deepen my faith. How to trust in God. In every situation, even situations like this, to trust God, that God is sovereign and that God is holy. Dale was a good friend. He was an excellent pastor. He was a devoted husband, a loving father. He was an elated grandfather. But to me and Greta, he was brother. I want to read a passage of scripture that I think is so fitting for this moment. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 55 through 58. It says, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. As Elizabeth said, Dale gave himself fully to everything he did. And I want to thank the church for loving him and caring for him. And I want to ask you if you'll continue to love them. Love Shelly and the kids and the grandkids. Lift them up each and every day. Because as Scott said, there's a there's a Del Roach empty hole here. We all loved him in a lot of different ways. 
And I'm especially going to miss him. Because we used to have a good time. I'm going to tell one story that I don't have here in my notes. And Mom, you, you might appreciate this. It's many years ago, I, my son was in college, and, and he was getting ready to come home for the summer. And, and I told him, I said, son, you're not, you're not going to lay around the house all summer. You're going to have to work. So I, I started a little lawn care business and bought some equipment and all this. And, and uh, Dale, from time to time, he just needed to get away. He just wanted to be outside. He wanted to come. So just a few months ago, this happened just, just recently, just a few months ago, he called me. He said, what you doing tomorrow? I said, well, I said, I got to cut grass. I, I'm, I'm headed down to mom's. I'm going to cut her yard. And then I got a few more I need to cut down in Rutherford County. And, and he says, hey, man, I said, what time are you going to be there? I'll be there. And so I told him, and he met me there, and we got there. And he says, what do you want me to do? I mean, he was itching to do something. And I said, well, listen, I said, take, take the push more, go over there, cut around mama's mailbox, and, and, and I'll, I'll cut the yard. <laughs> and so he took the push mower over there, and I, I'm, I'm going back and forth cutting mom's front yard. <laughs> And I go down and I turn around, and as I turn around, I'm look, I'm, I saw Dale. He had cut around the mailbox, and then he had gotten up in the flower bed. <laughs> he was cutting monkey grass. He was cutting any. If it was standing, it was getting. And I just stopped. And I just looked at him, and I didn't have the heart to tell him, stop. I thought, Maybe he just needs to cut something down. And, <laughs> and so I let him finish. As, as I was sitting there on the mower, I thought, Mom's going to kill us. <laughs> Dale was a lot of fun. He was a friend. He was a brother. And I thank the Lord for letting him be my brother. And I thank the Lord for the family that I have. The people that he put in my path, um, it started with you, Pastor Roach. I mean, you preached Matt's funeral, and you were there for my family from, uh, from the beginning. And uh, I can never thank you enough for that. But just what has happened, and I've seen what's happened. And yeah, I still, after all that, I still wanted him back. But I know one thing, and you said this when you preached Matt's funeral, and I didn't know you probably don't remember it, but what we see here on earth is like you said you would sit there and you would watch Shelley cross stitch. And you'd see it from the other side, and the other side of cross stitch, you can't, you don't know what it is. But when you when you get to the other side, you realize what it was all about. And um, I want to live as long as I can, but I can't wait for that day when I can see that more clearly. sitting in this congregation today who have lost someone that you love. But let me say this to you. There will be a day when you will see them again if both of you know who Jesus Christ is as Lord and Savior of your life. You know, it hit me, and I've shared it so many times with you as a fellowship. It hit me as a teenager in the life of my family when my father passed away. But one of the things that I remembered and, the, and that burning message that God put in my heart and He put in my mind when I was going through that as a teenager were the things that my mom and dad had taught me about what I should believe in in the Word of God and how God's Word... That God, when I came to know Jesus Christ, not only did He save me, but He gives me eternal life. That means that I have life forever. And that my dad, when he left this planet, I knew as a teenager it was complex, it was hard, it was difficult, it wasn't easy. But I knew that he had stepped into the very presence of the God that created him. My grandmother, I used to stay with her a lot. And she had this kitchen that was kind of like a Walton sort of room. You know, she had one of those big long tables. Everybody would sit around. And one of Shelley's first experiences was my grandmother's experience of, of going around and making sure everybody ate, you know. 
And Shelly's a light, light eater, you know, but my grandmother didn't believe in light eating. And one of the things that she would do is she would go around that table and if you, your plate was getting, getting empty, she would just scoop it out and she would plop it into your plate. Well, that happened to Shelly two or three times. And then the last time she came around, she'd eaten it all up. And I, we were sitting across the table from one another. And my grandmother came and she scooped this big as, I mean, a glob of mashed potatoes and plopped it down in Shelly's plate. She said, eat up, honey. And she just kept walking. And Shelly looked across the table and she said to me, I, 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 can't, I can't eat anymore. And my response to her was, you have no choice. <laughs> you got to do it. But I remember in that place of my grandmother's, on her wall was a picture of Jesus holding a lamb. And as he was holding that lamb, he was standing at this doorway and he was knocking on the door. That was the picture that I saw when I sat at those Sunday dinner meetings at my grandmother's house. And Christ is holding this lamb and he's knocking on the door. You know something interesting about that picture? is there was no doorknob on the outside of that door. When you looked at that door, what you saw was a door and there was no doorknob. There was no doorknob for Jesus to reach over and open that door and to walk in. Now why am I telling you that? And why do I think it's so vastly important for us to hear the Word of God and to understand that if we don't want to be a church like Laodicea, we have got to see Jesus standing at the door, knocking on the door, wanting to come into this place, wanting to be with us every Sunday, wanting to fill us with the Holy Spirit, wanting to teach us how to raise our kids, wanting to teach us how to raise, help raise our grandkids, wanting us to be able to live in such a way. Why am I telling you that visual image of that picture in my grandmother's house where Jesus is standing and He's knocking on the door and there's no doorknob. It's because of this. And this is how we're going to end up the Revelation of John study. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, did you hear that? If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in. I'll come in. I will come in and eat with that person. And they will be with me. I want every one of you to know that I don't know how I would live my life without the grace of God. I am a sinner. I was born into this world as a sinner. And if it wasn't for Jesus Christ and the cross of Calvary, I would die and go straight to hell because I cannot stand before God and justify myself. And nobody in this room can. And it is by the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross of Calvary that when He said it is finished, what He was saying was, that this idea of the grace of God coming to the earth in human form in His Son, Jesus Christ, was what it was all about. And that when we believe in Jesus Christ and we trust in the name of Jesus Christ, we understand what grace is to its nth degree. When someone is willing to give their son to die on a wicked cross to wash my sins away, and to wash your sins away. That is what grace is all about. Unmerited favor of God. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. I will never earn it. There is nothing that I will ever do that will make me good enough to stand before God. But there's going to be a day when I will stand before God. I don't know when that's going to be. But when I stand before God and God asks me one simple question, Why should I allow you into my kingdom? I'm not going to be able to say anything. I can't do anything. But because I know about the grace of Jesus Christ and the life that He gave, when I stand before God and the question is asked, why should I allow you into my eternal home? I'm not going to be able to say anything. But I have this 
image in my mind that Jesus is going to step right in front of me and he's going to say, because Father, he belongs to me. And that is the only way that I will ever get into heaven. It is because of the grace of God and the shed blood of Christ on Calvary. And we are encouragers of this grace. We should be telling this to this world, this world that wants to work in its own way and work under its own power. The only thing that will ever save this world and the only way that will ever save sinners in this world is the grace that has saved every one of us who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you're here today and you've never accepted Christ as the Savior of your life, it's a very simple thing. You you just simply call on His name and, and confess your sinfulness to Him. And say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner and I know that if I died today without you, I would die in my sins and I would go to hell. But because of you and because of what you've done and the grace that you brought into my life, Lord, I accept you as my Lord and as my Savior. And so we're taught about the grace of God. You go out tonight and you look at those skies and you, you just stand there for a while and you adjust your vision. The longer you stand out there in the dark and you look up at those stars tonight, You might only see a few of them to begin with, but if you'll stand out there for about 10 or 15 minutes and you keep gazing up into those skies, you will see thousands before the night is done. And that is the kind of God that we serve. An almighty God. A God who has control over chaos. A God who has control over sin. A God who has power over this world and the God who spoke this world into existence and the God who spoke the cosmos into existence. That is the kind of God that we serve. And when Cornelius went down before Peter to bow down before him, Peter understood fully who God was. And he told Cornelius, Cornelius, stand up. I am only a man. And when we have that kind of message and when we understand that kind of power and that kind of strength, then our world will be changed by that. It will not be changed by the President of the United States. It will not be changed by a Congress or Senate. It will not be changed by a thriving economy. It will not be changed by people who think they know it all. But our world will only be changed and chaos will only be destroyed when we understand our God as Peter understood his God and came to know him that this world is made for all sinners and that anyone that comes to Christ and bows down before him shall be saved and there is no other name under heaven by which we shall be saved and no other name of which we shall bow down before Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your self-control be known unto all men, for the Lord is at hand. Don't be anxious about anything, but through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus was about to be executed and he knew it. And when he was meeting with his disciples, they had gathered together and they were kind of wondering what was going to go on. And, and he said these words to them, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Thomas, who's been tagged as a doubter, Thomas had a question for Jesus. He said to Jesus, Lord, tell us. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man comes unto the Father except by me. 
And that is why each Sunday we lift Jesus up above everything else. So when this man steps up here and this praise team steps up here to lead you in a song, I want you to think about those words that Jesus said. And I want you to lift your voices to heaven. And I know we're missing some folks today. And I know this coronavirus is making a lot of people anxious. But let not your hearts be troubled. Don't let it happen. God's people said. Amen. Amen. Time measured out my days life carried me along in my soul I yearned to follow Christ but knew I'd never be so strong I looked hard at this world to learn how heaven could be gained just to end where I began where human effort is all in vain were it not for grace I can tell you where I'd be Wandering down some pointless road to nowhere With my salvation left to me And I know how that would go The battles I would face Here is all my praise Expressed with all my heart And given to the friend Who took my place And ran a course I could not start and when he saw in full just how much his love would cost he still went the final mile between me and heaven so i would not be lost were it not for grace I can tell you where I'd be just wandering down some pointless road to nowhere with my salvation left to me and I know how that would go 
paddles I would face Forever running but losing the race Were it not for grace Forever running but losing the race Were it not for In 25 years of teaching, I have taught a whole lot of students, most of whom I never see again after graduation. Some that become acquaintances over the years, and just a few that become a friend who remains in your life long beyond graduation. And even fewer are those that I have the privilege of walking with them through their doctoral work and pushing them hard and asking for revision after revision after revision and pushing hard again and they graduate and they still like me. And Dale was one of those brothers in Christ. And I think about him today and I wonder what he would have me say, and I can just hear him. He called me Doc, just for the two of us. He would say, I could just hear him say, Doc, just preach the gospel. Just preach the gospel, because it was that transforming gospel that changed his life. And made him the man that we have heard of today via video, hearing his voice and seeing his face, and all of us touched by his life. The gospel, Jesus Christ was the center of, of who he was, and, and I would be remiss to do anything less than just preach the gospel today. So I want to do that. I want to take us to the word, and I'm going to ask if you have your scriptures, if you have an electronic copy, I'm going to begin in Hebrews chapter 12. And then I'm going to back up into 2 Timothy chapter 4. I want us to hear this truth of this race that you and I, all of us, are on. The writer of Hebrews says in chapter 12, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, or the author and the finisher of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. So I read these words, let us run with endurance the race, keeping our eyes on Jesus. And then I look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. And these are the words of the Apostle Paul as he faced the reality of the end of his own life. Here's what he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. There is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. Would you pray with me as we look at God's word? Father, I pray that in the next few moments, you would help me just to open your word. And Father, as our brother has already done that via video, as we heard... Pastor Dale, just break down the gospel and 
remind us of our calling to follow Christ, I pray that you would help me to echo those words. And God, my prayer is today that even in his passing, Dale's life would influence somebody in this room to follow you more closely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want us to think about these texts beginning with this truth. There is a race that all of us are running. We all are. Every one of us is running some kind of race. We're headed in some direction. All of us created in the image of God. Created for his glory. And yet we are a people who by our birth and by our actions, we are a people who sin. We are children under wrath. We are dead in our trespasses and sins, separated from the one who created us. And yet he so loved us. He so loved us that he sent his son to die in our place to take upon himself the wrath of the Father, the penalty, the, the punishment for our sin. He died for us. But praise God, he didn't stay there. Praise God, it was a divine plan of God that, that he would bring his son to life again as a word to us that he who had paid the penalty for our sin was now the one who had also broken the power of death. And we stand in that hope and faith today. And then we're reminded that we have to make a choice about what we do with this truth. The scriptures tell us that if we turn from our sin and trust Jesus, we, we repent and we believe that God forgives us and God drops our sin to the bottom of the ocean. He throws it behind his back. He separates it from us as far as the east is from the west. He remembers it no more and he makes us clean and he makes us whole and he makes us his child. But we have to decide what we want to do with that. Will we live for self or will we live for Christ? We're all on some race. And here's what we know this day. Our brother's passing is a reminder to us that there is a finish line for all of us. And it is furthermore a reminder to us that it's not our call when the finish line shows up. Sometimes it's unexpected. Sometimes it's painful. But our God is always right. And I have no doubt that Dale would say to us today, if you're not following Jesus, you need to. And he would challenge you to do so with his life and with his words. And I offer that challenge to you too. You're running the race. Where are you headed? And even at the end of this service, if you would wish to follow Christ, I'll talk with you. One of the pastors of this church will find somebody to talk with you, I promise. We're all running a race. Here's point number two. We run this race by looking to Jesus. By looking to Jesus. If I hear in one ear, Dale saying to me, Doc, just preach the word. I hear in the other ear, just lift up Jesus. Just lift up Jesus. Not Dale Roach, but his Redeemer. And who is this, this Jesus? The one that the author of Hebrews said, look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Run this race with endurance and look to Jesus. Who is he? This Jesus is the baby in Bethlehem, prophesied long before he came by the prophets of the Old Testament. This is the teacher. He's the teacher who taught like nobody else had ever taught. This is the one who speaks to demons and they flee. 
This is the one who gives legs to the lame and sight to the blind and hearing to the, to the deaf. This is the one who draws children to his chest and welcomes them there, even while he also confronts the unrighteous religious leaders of the day. This is Jesus. This is Jesus who is, who is the master over nature. He speaks and the waves stop and the wind halts. They move at his command because he made everything that has been made. This is Jesus who is the master over the demonic. They know when he shows up. The demons know when Jesus shows up that they're in for it. They've lost that battle. This is the one who is the master over sickness. Even in the hem of his garment, he carried healing. And he is the master over death. Who is this Jesus? He's the crucified one. He's the resurrected one. He's the ascended one. And he is the one who's coming back again. And that day, that day will come. That day will come when he will reign as king of kings and lord of lords. And we will all bow before him as he is. And even the questions that don't make sense to us today, even if he doesn't give us all the answers, it won't matter then. Because we'll be before the Redeemer. We'll be before the one who suffered in our place and who orchestrated the events that you and I who are believers had the privilege of hearing the gospel from somebody and God authors our salvation. And that same God, that same Jesus, he's the finisher of our faith. And this we can know. He was the center of Dale's life. And we can trust that Jesus was there at the finish line. How do we run this race? We just look to Jesus. We're all running the race. We must look to Jesus as we do it. And here's point number three. Others, by their faithful living, encourage us to endure the race. This is what the writer of Hebrews said. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And in, in the context of that book, he has just laid out in the previous chapter, name after name after name of persons who just followed God. And their faith is a witness to us. Abraham, Moses, Rahab, Samson, David, the prophets. And you know what? We can add to that every other believer who has gone before us. And for some of us this day, we look back and we, we, we see in our mind the faith of a grandparent, the faith of parents who have gone before us, the faith of friends who just walked with God. The faith of pastors who just loved us. And put their arms around us and showed us how to walk with Christ. And we, we look at our brother's life today. You hear the stories of those who knew him best. We hear him preaching the word to us again. And it must be this day that we let his faith encourage us to press on. To keep running the race. Because that's what he would want of us. In fact, here's the way that I, that I think of Dale. I'm going to take you to a story in the in the book of Acts. Let me turn there to Acts chapter 5. And there are great things happening in the church in that day, and I pick up in verse 14. 
And here's what the text says to us. Believers were added to the Lord in increasing numbers, multitudes of both men and women. Now, here's what I want you to see in verse 15. As a result, they would carry the sick out into the streets and lay them on cots and mats so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. Now, there's all kinds of miraculous taking place there, but here's what I want you to see. They wanted to be at least in the shadow of Peter, for there they found power. You see, every once in a while, every once in a while, in this world, you and I are privileged and blessed just to walk in the shadow of a man who walks with God. How that shadow has fallen on each of us is different. For some, the shadow has been there longer, and we grieve with you. For others of us, we intersected our lives at some point, and it may have been brief, but the shadow is still there because of the man that he was. That's how I think about him. I may have been the professor, but I'm quite certain I'm a better man because I was in the shadow of my student. And I wonder again what he would, what he would say to us today. I can, I can just see him. That warm, welcoming smile that just drew you to him. I can see his eyes just lighting up. Maybe he walks to the side of this pulpit and I can, I can hear him say, I've, I've fought the good fight. I have, I have run the race. And I have kept the faith. But then I can hear him say to us, you know what? All is well with my soul. And y'all... Lock your eyes on Jesus and keep running the race. And that's what we must do. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, you're so good to us to give us eternal life. You're so good to us to have sent your son to die in our place. You're so good to us to let us share life with people like Dale Roach. Though God, it seems like a life far too brief. We know that's not our call. And we thank you, Lord, that we have been privileged to walk in our brother's shadow. Now I pray this day, Father, that you would give sweet, sweet comfort to Dale's family. That your presence would be more real than it's ever been. The comfort of the Spirit would be so obvious they just rest in that. And for this congregation, Father, I thank you for the opportunities I've had to to be with them at different times. I pray, I pray, God, that they would lock arms together and press on for your glory. And then God, if there's anyone here today who, who doesn't know you personally, who's heard the gospel from our brother's voice, and I trust from mine, Lord, may your spirit convict and draw someone to you today. God, help us to run the race. We lock our eyes on Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. As I sat there a moment ago, I looked at my phone. I want you to know that the last text I had from Dale said two things. Love on Shelly. It's, it's hard for her. 
And the second thing he said, I love you, brother. And I'm never going to forget that. When I was a kid, my granddaddy taught me how to shoot a gun. And he would say, well, is that what you're, was that what you're aiming at? And I had to admit, most of the time it wasn't in those days. I can honestly say that what Dale has aimed at his whole life is letting people know about the grace of Christ. We're going to end today by singing, It Is Well With My Soul. Will you stand, everybody but the family, if you would stand with me.
说。